What is going on to all of my Guardians of the Galaxy fans out there? And welcome back to my channel, Movie Files. We are here today talking all things Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. So this will be a spoiler review. Again, we're talking spoilers. So if you haven't seen the film yet, no worries. I actually have a spoiler-free review on the channel now that you all can check out. But if you have seen this film in all of its glory, you come to the right channel. So in today's video, we're talking plot. We're talking story. What worked, what didn't work, cameos, Easter eggs. We're talking those post credit scenes and what it can mean for the future of these characters in the MCU. So again, just another warning, full spoilers ahead. But before we get into the spoiler discussion, I want to thank you all for clicking on today's video. Consider hitting the like button, man. If you enjoyed this film, if you're enjoying the conversation, hit the like button, as well as consider sharing the video, as well as commenting below. I'm doing this to talk to you all. Yes, I'm going to be getting out my thoughts and what worked and didn't work, but I want to interact with you all on your perspective. What did you love? What did you like? What did you hate about the film? What were some Easter eggs, some cameos I might have missed in this breakdown? And what do you all want to see next from the Guardians? Because again, we'll, we'll get to it at the end. There's a new group to look at, and we're going to speculate when we can see them again. And there is someone on Earth now that is so low dolo. So we'll get into all that stuff in today's video. But again, I want to know your thoughts in the comments below. So let me just share with you all. And again, you can watch my spoiler-free review. I didn't get a better structure of what I thought about the pacing, the direction, the writing, you know, and all that stuff, the more analytical side of it. But today's video is more of a breakdown, really like kind of analyzing the scenes and, and really getting into those discussions. Again, spoilers ahead. And I'll be leaving time codes in the description of this video. But first thing out of the way, fan-wise, I love the Guardians. As you guys can probably see behind me, I got Guardians 1 here, uh, Guardians 2 here. And as far as those films go, Guardians 1 is like a top five MCU film for me. It has so much heart, has passion behind it. I love James Gunn's direction, the way he wrote the characters. I just love the banter that we have with those characters. And it, it gets emotional, man. That film, every time I get to certain parts in that film, it always gets me. So I love that one. Guardians 2, I'll be honest, I don't watch as often as I do Guardians 1, and I do like Guardians 2. It's probably, last time I checked my MCU rankings, it's somewhere in that 10 to 15 range as far as, you know, out of the 32 films has been in the MCU. So it is something I enjoy, but I don't revisit a lot. But there are moments, you know, I thought Ego is probably top tier villain within their franchise, the Guardians. And we'll talk about the villain in this film with High Evolutionary. But I really enjoyed the Ego and Peter reveal. And this there's a lot of good moments. And it's a beautiful film to look at. Gamora and Nebula's relationship expanding upon more. So it's a fun film. But again, I just don't revisit it as much as I do the first one. Of course, we know from 2014 meeting them, 2017 having their sequel, we see them again in Infinity War. And I really enjoyed the mixture of seeing the Guardians interacting with Tony Stark and Spider-Man and Doctor Strange. And of course, that's where we got the uh, the beautiful relationship between Rocket and Thor and Groot being a side of that team. And they were fun there. In game, we didn't get a ton of Guardians. Obviously, we had Rocket, we had Nebula, and obviously we get them coming back at the end there, forming the As Guardians of the Galaxy. So that stuff was, was fine. It was fun. Obviously, you want the team together, which brings me into from 2019, we didn't see them again until 2022 with Thor Love and Thunder and I'll be honest Taika <laughs> I'm a fan of Taika's work man I like Thor Ragnarok love Jojo Rabbit you know the Hunt of the Wilder people he is he's a great director I know he's been getting a lot of slack lately especially after Thor Love and Thunder but I, feel, I still think he's a great writer and director but the way he handled the Guardians looking back on it I really don't know what the purpose of the Guardians being in that film besides just having the continuity of like last time you saw them they were with Thor so I guess it only makes sense that we see them again I, I don't I don't count that as an appearance because they're barely in the movie they don't have an impact on that movie at all but then the next time we saw them that was 2022 we saw them that same year in December which was the holiday special now you all can watch my review on that I wasn't the biggest fan of that holiday special reasons being love the group I love the group together and I love certain characters by themselves, you know, Rocket and so on and so forth. But not, I'm not the biggest fan of Drax and I'm not the biggest fan of Mantis. But if you saw my spoiler free review of this film, you know how I feel about them after this movie, which we'll talk about. But here we are, volume three. I'm here for it. I've seen it twice now. I saw it uh, at a press screening and I had a fan event. And this is my thoughts after seeing it the second time. And I will say, my score has went up since seeing it a second time, and we'll get into that in today's breakdown. So with all that out of the way, let's get into breaking down the film. Again, spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. Let's talk about the opening scene. 
which, man, you talk about getting misty-eyed, man. So we opened the movie with introducing us to Baby Rocket. He's in the cage. We see a bunch of other raccoons, and it's just like oh, your heart melts for him right now. I am just immediately already, and we knew I knew going into this, and a lot of you all knew this as well, that this was going to explore the origins of Rocket. I'm going to tell you all right now. Everything that we got with those scenes was just beautiful. Now, I would have probably combined some scenes, and, I, and I'll get to it here, that I thought that when we were cutting back and forth from the flashbacks to what the Guardians were doing to save Rocket's life, which we'll talk about, it was kind of distracting, my first viewing, but on a second rewatch, it flowed a lot better. But let's get into the moment. He's in the cage, looking adorable, looking sad, and we see the hand coming in, knowing that, it, and assuming that it was high evolutionary, which it was. Hands coming in, baby rockets all scared and shaking, and then the camera. Oh man, the transition, the the craft that James Gunn puts in this film. This is one of the best, like as far as direction and the shot selections and the way that he sets the mo the mood and the tone of this film. All great stuff. Hand comes in the cage, and I'm talking about transitional switch from one scene to the next. This is absolutely genius. We see Baby Rocket's face, kind of his eyes and his nose, and then the camera, you know, we, we kind of pan out, and it's the older Rocket as he's sitting down on the little steps there, and we get a cover song as, as from one of my favorite songs, and I'm a big fan of Radiohead. We have Creep. It was a cover version of the song. It was I would have preferred the real song, uh, but I, I assume it's probably licensing <laughs> issues, even though Disney has all the money in the world. But And I'll say this, quintessential viewing would be Guardians 1, 2, and it would help if you've seen Infinity War and Endgame game just to understand the Gamora side of it all and then losing that version of the Gamora so I, I would say that's necessary viewing into the holiday special if you all skipped it which again I didn't really like it but there are some big things that we learned in the holiday special which is shown in this opening sequence as Rockets kind of going through nowhere as we all know as Guardians fans this was introduced to us in Guardians 1 but in the holiday special we learned that after doing all their Guardians of the Galaxy and right and they stacked up enough coins and stacked up enough units to actually buy nowhere and, and restructure it and make it a safe haven for people and there's now the guardians of the galaxy headquarters so i kind of like that again that was established in the special as well as Antis is the sister of peter again i just love the family unit man as we see rocket going through the town while the music's playing on the zoom player he goes into like a, a bar that they have and again this is something else that was kind of alluded to in the special that Peter's obviously still in his feelings. He's still upset about losing Gamora, reasonably so. See, he's drunk, and we see that this is something that he frequently does because we see Gamora picking him up, walking to his house, his little apartment, and we see the other guardians like Drax saying, oh, he did it again, and you see Groot, you know, rubbing his head, and we see a beautiful title sequence. And I'm just telling you all that as far as, like, the feeling that it got to me was just, like, it feels so good to be back with them because, again, yes, we get them in Thor. We we saw the special we weren't necessarily together in the Avengers films because obviously they were split up and then the blip, I should say. So we really haven't gotten them together since 2017. Uh, and again, you can count this the special. But it was just so good to see them together. And then the way that, again, the song was cutting in and them walking in slow motion, I was just happy to be back with these characters that I love so much. So we see that Nebula puts Peter in bed and he holds her arm and says, I miss you. And I, or he says, I love you, Gamora. Of course, again, that's just a, a moment that he's still having. She puts him to bed and then we cut to Rocket. And he is in his apartment and he's taken off his, his shirt or whatever. And then we get our first sighting of the key card that was very critical and very special to him and it seems like it's something that he keeps with him at all times because he puts it in his pocket so and we'll talk about the importance of that key card a little bit later but as he's doing that we cut to outer space and we see adam warlock coming in immediately goes to rocket's house he's flying throwing him through the buildings and you know rocket eventually escapes and we see nebula stepping up let me tell y'all something right now. When it comes to Nebula, that arm, which again, I guess <laughs> the more and more I say this, I guess that holiday special is like a critical part of viewing, understanding where her arm came from. Because if you guys have seen the special, the arm from Bucky, which he wore <laughs> in Endgame, he said he was going to get that arm in Infinity War, and, and, and indeed he did. But this arm is way badass, man. Oh, and knowing that they kept Rocket alive, I just need Rocket and Shiri and people from Wakanda to get together to build some other tech from our for our new Avengers, but neither here nor there. That's a side note. This arm is badass. 
for my Terminator fans, it was like the T-1000. It, it, it almost seemed like she can, whatever she puts her mind to, it can create. You know, we see her use it as a laser, as a light, as a sword, as we'll talk about here. So that arm is badass. Shout out to Rocket for just being a genius making that. So we see that she fights Adam Warlock. She's able to, you know, knock him out briefly. He comes out of the, the rubble of the building, crashes her in the ground. And that scene, to show you the... The force of Adam Warlock and the powers and the scaling, the power scaling they have. And I will just address it now as far as the Adam Warlock of it all this film. I, my comic book knowledge of him just really is boiled down to when I read the Film and Gauntlet was the comic run. That was my entry point to Adam Warlock. And just from that comic alone, you just understand how important he is, how important he was to that story, especially him having a soul gem in his head, which once we didn't get introduced to Adam Warlock in Infinity War and Endgame, I was like, well, Clearly, at this point, they're just going to take creative liberties and give us Adam Warlock as they did in this film, because he's much different than what we got in the, you know, from what I remember from him in the comics and how integral he was. As far as narratively speaking, I'm, I'm kind of torn on like, I didn't hate the portrayal. I didn't love the portrayal. I didn't necessarily like the portrayal. I'm somewhere in the middle. Because narratively speaking, it makes sense as we find out later in the film that he is somewhat, he was still in his infant stages. And that explains why he was so kind of incompetent. And he was making, he was like a child. He was, you know, very young in his, you know, he was woken up early as the priest is, um, says to the high evolutionary uh, when they get their whole scene and what they've been up to. So let me know in the comments how you felt about Adam Warlock. I love how in this open scene, knocks out Nebula like it's nothing, breaks her jaw, breaks her ribs, throw her into the building. We see him fighting Groot, which was, you know, I'm like, damn, did they just kill Groot that easily? But, you know, we see Groot kind of takes him on and, and wraps him up in his whole tree branches. And eventually he, you know, flies in the sky and breaks Groot and decapitates his head. I'm like, dude, okay, Adam Warlock, even though this isn't the Adam Warlock that I preferred from the comics, I'm, I'm liking, again, show a threat. You, you show a threat by him, demand, you know, dismantling the Guardians, which we'll get into my criticism about that here in a second. But he takes them out. Meanwhile, you know, Peter wakes up because at this point, Adam Warlock shoots Rocket in the chest. And we see at this point, Peter is going against him. And while Adam Warlock is about to blast him with his, you know, his blasters, this is where Drax the Destroyer. I said this in my spoiler-free review that I haven't been a fan of Drax because after Guardians 1, he's just a joke. You know, Guardians 2, he just, and I really did not like his portrayal in the Guardians 2. It's like, I, I really am a fan of James Gunn, but the decision to make Drax just the jokey guy, the funny guy, just jokes, 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 and forgot about everything from Guardians 1, which is the vengeance of Thanos, avenging his daughter and his wife, all this stuff was like thrown out of the window. Wasn't a fan of that version, and I haven't been a fan of Drax since volume one but then in this film james gunn puts some respect on drax the destroyer's name as we see him saying to adam warlock pick on someone your own size and they're going toe-to-toe -to -toe and drax is you know he had on him and i think again and I wasn't the most familiar with the Guardians from a comic book perspective. Drax the Destroyer, I'm not saying he can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Hulk, but he can he can have those type of levels of strength, right? And, and endurance and things of that nature. And we see that in this scene. Like, he's going blow for blow with uh, Adam Warlock, but inevitably Adam Warlock has, he overpowers Drax, and he eventually gets him down and starts beating him in the face and cracking his jaw open. And we and also, too, going back to that fight, because I don't want to undercut, because if you guys haven't, so I, I don't like Drax. I haven't liked Drax since Volume 1. This is a joke. But normally, when Drax is in combat, whether it is in Volume 2 or even in that special, he's always like, ha, <laughs> he has fun while fighting okay that's cool it's like this guy's pretty you know unhinged just goofy when he was like playful when he's in the middle of a fight but he was serious man he was like very much this was like okay you hurt my friends this is like things are at stake so i like the more serious version of this fight he's getting beat down eventually nebula as she kind of puts herself back together i don't know why i mean i know why because they didn't want to film the end or have Adam Warlock be off the, the table. She stabs him. She makes her arm into a sword and stabs him in the chest. So I'm thinking to myself, Nebula, did you not learn your lessons from Thor? I mean, Infinity War, you should have went for the head. And then in an end game, you were in the hut. You were in your father's hut when, when Thor chopped off your dad's head. You go for the head, Nebula. You cut off Adam Warlock's head. Why do you stab him in the stomach? Cut off the man's head. She didn't do that again. If she would did that, you know, we obviously don't have Adam Warlock in the rest of the movie. But that was just something that I thought was kind of funny. But she stabs him in the chest. He goes off. Meanwhile, I don't want to leave out, too, because it, it was a small subplot with Kraglin. His whole thing with learning dude's weapon and all that stuff. He tries to stop Adam Warlock, but it doesn't work because he has it. 
he hasn't used a heart, as we'll talk about later with Yandu's appearance. But that goes on. So now the plot at hand is Rocket's badly injured. They, they put this uh, healing device on Rocket. It doesn't work. They put him on a medical bay. And they find out that he has a, a kill switch inside of his heart. And they're like, wait a minute, where does this come? Who puts a kill switch on someone's heart? And this is what Nebula says. Clearly, it, he must be a property of someone very important. So the whole plot is we have plugged into Rocket. She finds some type of serial code or some type of information that leads him, that leads the Guardians to, you know, eventually the high evolutionary. But they go to, I think it was called Orgo Corp, if I'm not mistaken, if that's the name of high evolutionary's headquarters where he has and does a lot of his doings. And it's kind of like a hub that they go to, a kind of a peaceful hub. They are heading to go there to bypass the kill switch so they can save their friend. So this is where we get our first set of flashbacks. And my first viewing, the usage of the flashbacks was distracting to me. By no means am I saying I didn't appreciate, if I'm being honest, I actually enjoyed the flashbacks more than I was enjoying this mission that we're going to talk about here. Because it was just emotional, and I, and I love Rocket. He's my favorite Guardians. He's one of my favorite Marvel characters. And I, I was really enjoying that. But again, cutting from flashbacks to, you know, them doing a mission. Flash, it was kind of distracting. But on a second rewatch, I really come to appreciate how it was used because narratively, on a second rewatch, it fits into what the Guardians were doing because the whole thing about his flashback besides getting his origins, where he comes from, you know, they kept mentioning friends and him having friends, him being friends with Lila and Teeth and Floor and how important that friendship was to him, you know, and paralleling that to his friends and family now. So it, it was used really well. Again, I, I probably, the only thing I would have changed about the flashbacks was probably condense them and just put them all in one piece and, you know, kind of do it that way. Which brings me to, again, got to understand, I'm a Rocket fan. He is my favorite Guardians. He adds so much flavor to the Guardians that I will admit that when it comes to him not being as involved in the main narrative was something that disappointed me because this is the last time that we're going to see this group of guardians so i just wanted rocket to be more involved in the main plot he eventually gets into the film as we'll talk about later in regards to him being you know they help him they save him and all this stuff but i just wish that rocket was more involved in the a plot and this is where my if you want to call it a script revision or something i wish they would explore more instead of for having rocket be critically hurt and be in sideline for all the film like it reminded me of you know halloween fans when Laurie Stroll was in the hospital for all of Halloween Kills. He's on the hospital bed or on the recovering table the whole film pretty much into the last 30, 45 minutes or so. I would have thought it would have been more creatively speaking, more engaging if Rocket fought, you know, Adam Warlock, but he wasn't badly wounded. Instead, some way, somehow in the middle of the fight, he mentions Lila's name. And that's how Rock is like, wait a minute. And, you know, it could still pl play into the to the, to the flashback. He could still have flashbacks while things are going on. It reminds him of when he was little, right? Because he's getting closer and closer to the high evolutionary. So it's kind of bringing back all these memories. Maybe after Adam comes to, to the attack the Guardians, he fails at doing so. He sends... You know, she's been looking for Rocket, but she finally found him because the High Evolutionary sent, you know, she overheard Adam Warlock was going after him. So she sends him a, a mission. And now the mission is that Rocket wants to save his friends with the help of his new friends. So that to me, was, it would have got Rocket more involved in the main plot. It doesn't really take anything away of the film. Obviously, the sense of urgency is not there because there was, what, 48 hours before his life was going to be killed. You can do the same thing with Lila. She's, you know, High Evolutionary is threatening to kill her. So that adds the rushing of it all. And, you know, they have to find out where he is. They can still go to the, you know, the, the place that we're going to break down here, the meaty, organic place they go to. So I, I, I think there was a way to have Rocket more involved. Involved. But let me know how you guys feel about it as far as Rocket being sidelined for most of the film and substituting him not being a part of the A plot with getting all the B plot stuff with the flashbacks. So let me know how you guys felt about that. The first one is of young Rocket. He's frightened. He has, I think he has his first surgery when he could scalp and, and, you know, experiment on his brain. He's thrown in his cage. Batch 89, I believe, was the batch that they were, the unit they were in. He's frightened. And this is where he meets, you know, Lila. He meets Tease and he meets Floor. And again, it just sets the tone and it sets this friendship that he had, that they embraced him and where 
you understand why the Guardians are so important to Rocket is because he's had this type of relationship parallel to how important the Guardians are to him now because he's he's been seeking this type of family since losing his family, as we find out in this film. So I thought the flashbacks, again, on a second rewatch, really gave me what I didn't appreciate from the first one. So throughout these, and I'll just go over the flashbacks now, we see them dancing and celebrating at one point, and they give each other their names, and this is where Rocket comes up with his name. He's going to take all his friends to a you know a rocket ship because he sees one when he's talking to the high evolutionary and all that stuff was emotional another important thing within the flashbacks is the high evolutionary and rocket's relationship the way it starts it, it seemed to be like he was and i'm referring to the high evolutionary which i'll talk about him in a second as far as like what i thought about him as a villain seemed to be one of a softer side when we first see them interacting and he's playing the music explaining the music and all that stuff and talking about the creation of counter earth but then inevitably the conversation leads to, and, and the little baby Rocket's voice was just so adorable, but the conversation inevitably leads to kind of his motives, which is perfection is, is the thing that he strives for. It's just trying to constantly make things perfect. Now, not having been too familiar with High Evolutionary, my only experience prior to this film was he was in a, like one or two episodes in X-Men in the 90s, and he was in like one episode of Spider-Man Unlimited. Those are shows I watched back in the day. But I had never really read him or, or really the deep dive in him in the comic book run. So this is kind of my entry point to him. And there's definitely some creative liberties that they took with the character. But there are some things that they do take from the comics. Like he is the creator of Counter Earth. He does have connecting ties to Adam Warlock. And they have a relationship where, if I'm not mistaken, in the comics, Adam Warlock is actually hired by you know High Evolutionary to protect Counter Earth from uh, Man Beast or something like that in the comics. So there are things that they do take from the comics and implement into this version of the character, which I'll get back to the flashback, but just generally speaking, performance, and I like the actor, by the way, he was great in Peacemaker, and that's that was the first time I was ever introduced to him. The performance was solid. On my first watch of the film, I wanted more of his motives. I didn't really understand his powers, where they came from, but then again, going back on the second watch, he actually mentions it where his power stem from that he's been perfecting his technology and now gravity is something that he can use to his advantage so all that subtext that i was like where where's the motives where is he coming from where does he get his powers from on a second while i'm like oh okay i still think it could have been maybe expanded upon a little bit more and explore more of him but again this is more of a guardians film then there is the villain film which i will say Guardians of the Galaxy villains, Ronan's a wash. Ronan was just a you know a puppet to Thanos, so I, I don't really count him. That was more of establishing the Guardians than it was, you know, having a big bad villain. Ego was a solid villain because it does have personal ties to obviously Peter, and I really enjoy Kurt Russell. He's a legend, he's a goat. So I thought that he was really good. But on a second rewatch, man, I think it's safe to say that the high evolutionary is the best villain of any of the Guardians films. It's dark. He was very just, you know, I'm an animal lover. I have a dog, love him to death. The the animal cruelty that he was betraying on doing his, his experimenting and, and desiderating certain animals. And the way he, I mean, I was just like, oh, I can't wait to the Guardians beat his ass, which they do, which we'll get to that point a little bit later. But generally speaking, I, on a second rewatch, I appreciated his villainous, you know, ways. So let me know how you all felt about the high evolutionary as a whole from the performance, motives, you know, anything you guys can think of. Let me know your thoughts on him in the comments. We kind of cut back into Aisha, the high priestess, and the relationship she has with the high evolutionary so we find out in a very early scene in the film that he was the one that not only put them on this path to getting rocket but he was the creators of her civilization and her race and he's created a lot of different things throughout the galaxy and, and they say later in the film gamora says that he's considered to be a god to some corners of the galaxy so we we get that establishment there connective tissues between guardians two and three and that there were connective ties tells them after adam fails and he threatens to kill adam and to kill all her people get me rocket or i'm gonna wipe out your whole race we get all that set up but this is where the film to me even on a second rewatch, there are moments in this organism, this planet that is, was grown, you know, organically grown. The mission, even on a second rewatch, it, the jokes kind of fall flat for me in the scene. And then there's like this fake out death that we get with Drax. And on that note, while it's on top of mind, this film had a couple fake out deaths that were just like, well, are you going to end? I'm glad no one died, but it was just like, how many times are we going to fake out the deaths of characters? But anyway, 
let's talk about the scene. So this is where they establish that they have to go, and this is where Rockets, his information is in the database at this place. They're gonna break in, and we, you know, we talk about when Peter has the conversation with Mantis, and they kind of plant the, the seeds for him going back to his grandfather because that's a conversation that Mantis has with him as him and Nebula and the whole Guardians are breaking through the force fields. They end up getting caught by the Ravengers. This is where Sylvester Stallone and the Guardians that we met, they get involved in the story because Nebula reached out to them, and this is where we find out that Gamora is actually the leaders of the of Ravengers. And obviously, go back and forth between her and Peter. He's trying to help her remember what kind of relationship they had, the back and forth they had and whatnot. I will say, even on a second rewatch, I still wish that there was a way that that Gamora would have had the memories of our Gamora. Like, sure, it was very emotional to see her die in Infinity War. But to me, just to wipe out that relationship, kind of looking back on it, I wish they didn't do that because, you know, I really do appreciate the relationship between her and Peter and just the relationship she has with all the Guardians and, and all that stuff that we established in the first two films. And I just, I don't know, man, I just wish there was a way to maybe rock it to, you know, he's a genius to make up some type of device that captured all the events and, and make her watch this so she can, you know, understand what they went through. And not saying that if she would have watched the video, she would completely change her mind. Oh, okay. Yeah, I love you guys. I love you, Peter. But I just wish like very much so think of what they did with Loki and his show that that was 2012's Loki and then obviously when he went to the TVA he saw everything from that point on to when he dies in Infinity War and that he ended up being a good guy he ended up working with his brother Thor and ended up being a hero of a sense and sacrificing his life and whatnot so I wish there was just a way that our Gamora would her memories would have been implemented in the 2014 version of Gamora that we know was taken from her timeline or she stepped out of her timeline and in, in, in game. So but either way, she's working with the Ravengers. She's going to help out the Guardians break into the where they need to be to get the, the information they need to save their friend's life. So as this whole thing is shaking out, we get cameo, or not cameos, but we have roles played by uh, Nathan Fillion. And then everyone on the internet hates that James Gunn puts his his now wife, uh, Jennifer Holland, in, in most of his projects. Now in this film. And, and, and I don't know why people are all in their feelings. Like, she is an actress prior to her being just the wife of <laughs> James Gunn. But that's neither here nor there. She's in the movie. She's uh, like an operational person. And Nathan Fillion is like one of the guards. The Guardians break into their situation. And, and this is where I said the, the comedy to me, when they're having the conversation between like, Nathan Fillion has like a doofus on his team and they compare that to what's going on with Drax. I thought that joke went on way too long. That's just a nitpick. It's just, you know, comedy is objective. I found all that stuff to be a little goofy. But anyway, we know the plan gets all mucked up because Jennifer Holland sees that aren't those the same people that was given like a wanted listing earlier? So she sends all the guards to them. We have a bit of a fight sequence between Mantis and Drax and the rest of the guards. And also, I will say another joke that I thought was funny is when Mantis uses her powers to make the guard, you know, fall in love with Drax. That was kind of funny to see and Drax react to it. But they get into a fight. Like I said, Nathan Fillion, we get a fake out, somewhat of a fake out death because the way that this scene was played out, like in slow motion, he gets shot in the chest, he gets shot in the back. And I'm like, what, what are they doing? We're not going to kill Drax this early. And they manage to, you know, get out of the, the building and, and no one dies, but they get what they need. They get the information they need to help out Rocket, their friend. They end up, and I will say before I kind of move on, I will say the scope and the scale of that, and this is such a James Gunn design because he's such, he has such an imaginative mind and he loves to play with like gooey, disgusting stuff if you've seen Slither and seen his other work. So that the the visual uh, effect of this planet was pretty cool, but as well as just the setup, everything was bright, it was colorful, it was, you know, everything was organic. So creatively speaking, it was a cool, you know, scene. It's just that I just felt like the jokes are a little bit off. The actual mission just seemed so clunky and just weird to me. Let me know how you guys felt about that mission as a whole, but I, I did, I do want to give props to just the production design of it all, the practical, the practical effects that was in that scene was pretty awesome. And also the scale, all the experiments, that the high evolutionary has like that was like i mean we're talking i, I thought of uh rogue rogue one star wars when they had all their files and it's just like literally thousands of feet you know 19 football fields worth of uh you know information they had so i thought that was pretty crazy so they get the, the information find out that it's been wiped clean because one of the high evolutionaries recorders i think was his name one of his scientists took the information because they knew the guards were going to go there took the information put it in his head so now the new mission is we got to find this scientist and then they kind of put two and two together i think they find out that the information is at their main headquarters, which is Counter Earth. So that's kind of now where they're going to be headed into. And while all this is shaking out, we do get one of our big flashbacks, which is this is where Rocket finds out that Batch 89 will not be going to Counter Earth. They will not be visiting the blue sky forever. 
because the high evolutionary after he takes Rocket, and then this goes back to what I mentioned earlier, where does his power stem from? He was like all kind of woozy when he got Rocket out of his cage because he was just doing one of his treatments to, you know, do the, the gravity fields that he has, his powers or whatever. So he grabs Rocket. He's kind of like, how did you do this? How did you, man, you're my creation. How did you know how to fix this issue that I was having? Because he ends up, his whole thing was perfecting the perfect species and they were violent. Now, due to Rocket's tips and suggestions, they're not as violent as they, well, they're not violent at all. They're, you know, perfectly, you know, non-violent like Rocket and, and Batch 89 is. So that is established. But you're going to counter Earth, I'm killing you and all Batch 89 because you're an abomination. So Basra Rocket gets the idea to now it's time to break out his friends. And this is where we get the call back to earlier in the film when we see that key card. The key card is now we see the creation and that that's how he was going to break himself out and his friends to just take a ship and go off and, you know, save their lives. Unfortunately, High Evolutionary knew that Rocket was going to probably make, you know, do this. You know, he breaks Lila out and Lila gets shot in the back. And I'm like, oh. Man, that, that broke my heart, man. And then seeing Rocket scream, High Evolutionary kind of like, oh, you win this, the screaming contest, the crying contest, get back in your cage. And this is when my man Rocket goes ham. Rocket so jumps on the High Evolutionary, scratches his face all the way up. Like the result that we see when his mask, his face comes off, that was Rocket. That's what he did to him, just scratching, just tore up his face. He comes, you know, the guards come in, they shooting that rocket. Rocket kills them, but unfortunately, the stray bullets kill Floor and Teeves. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, man, this is, you know, and again, I talked about it in my non spoiler review the emotional moments in this scene. Th this scene here, and we're going to talk about it here. The, the third act was just, I was a wreck. I was an emotional wreck, man, because I love these characters so much. But that was one of the moments that I got emotional because I'm like, that is so sad, man. I'm, I love animals and just seeing animals dying like that and obviously tying into the narrative of the film, that being his friends and them wanting to live forever. I, it got me there. Let me know if you guys got emotional when we saw the deaths of his friends. But that then pulls us back into a, they try to use the, the information they find out that rockets really die so they really got to go into high gear they really got to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the high evolutionary so they make it their mission to go to counter earth so on counter earth they land and again i applaud and i'm this is just me being a dc fan i cannot wait to see him get his hands on superman and just the practicality and just the, the special effects and the production practical effects on all the variation of the creatures has been perfected by the high evolutionary that is just practical magic man i love that they use costumes and hair and makeup we got pigs we got you know fox bat looking care i mean it was just pandas I, I loved it everything about the visual effects in the scene which is absolutely a, like award-winning like give them an oscar an, at least a nomination for the practicality because it was just the creatures and the designs those the the henchmen of the high evolutionary there was like a pig and like a falcon looking thing it, it, it's beautiful beautiful uh to the production team and this is where the comedy worked for me when they go to the counter earth they meet that one family and they go into the house they're obviously speaking a different language well first pro the joke with the drag store on the ball at the girl's face they showed that in one of the trailers so that kind of I, I saw that coming it was still kind of funny you know at this point going to one of the the creatures homes and you know they're very welcoming and this is where again the comedy really when drax is trying to lay on the, on the couch what's the this has multiple purposes and the, trying to translate what they were saying and the drawing oh can i it's so nice peter can i keep that like that stuff to me was really funny inevitably they find out where their location is she points it out and they take the car we get the first f-bomb of the mcu which i thought was hilarious as well and so at this point kind of split up again we have peter nebula and groot are going to the high evolutionary to meet with them meanwhile we have Max and mantis stand back to watching rocket because nebula's on the ship and by this point in the movie she's unfortunately she wants to break she's like i don't want to do this anymore i don't care about any of the stuff you guys going on I, I helped you break into it let me go on my way but they're like we don't have time for this so they kept her on the ship but she unfortunately made a call to Morlock and his mom to let them know when she's at. So they're on their way to them. So that's what's going on there. Going on to, they meet the high evolutionary, Peter, and to take them out and, and to take the scientists, which we'll get into. Meanwhile, while that was happening, this is where we have Drax and Mantis. They go to go to them. But meanwhile, while they're driving to the high evolutionary to his main headquarters, they're driving through the city and they're seeing all the like this is not the perfect civilization this is not the perfect society i mean you got people selling meth and beating each other up it's the hood it's the ghetto right 
So Peter addresses this, like, you think this is a perfect society? you got people selling meth and beating each other up. And he's like, yeah, you're right. This isn't a perfect society. This is why I have to start all over from scratch. And he, and throughout the film, we see him experimenting on kids, well, not experimenting on kids, but testing these kids, which we'll talk about here in a second. So he has his next plan to start a new civilization. So he, and this is, again, this is what this film is very dark, not only from the animal brutality and animal cruelty side of it all. Him and just like, I'm, if I don't need you, I'm wiping you away. He completely annihilates his whole creation, man. He's blowing up the homes, blowing up the people. And I'm like, damn, this is dark stuff. This is the easily the darkest Guardians film and arguably one of the darkest Marvel films. I'm being honest with you all. Of course, you know, Endgame and Infinity War, that's half of humanity blip. That's pretty dark stuff. And obviously other, you know, Winter Soldier and Civil War, and there's dark moments, but that this was pretty dark, y'all. So he's killing all the people. They realize what he's doing. Meanwhile, this is where Adam Warlock finally pops up while one of the pig creatures was trying to take Rocket and, and Morris fighting them while his mom dies. We get to, we see the, the character die in there and he's upset. They're on the ship now and we see Peter and group fighting off and killing off his henchmen was a very cool action sequence i will say the action in this film was pretty top notch especially one of my favorite scenes of a marvel film in recent memory the hallway scene that will break down peter ends up grabbing the main scientist and throws him out of the window and they kill him they should have killed him no mercy for that guy at all they take the the mind the information they need and Gamora gets the ship at this point. Meanwhile, Mantis, Drax, and Nebula jump on the ship thinking they need to save Peter and Groot. They're going off to space, very Infinity War when, when Peter went off to space. Another, I don't want to say fake out, but it was like they were alluding to them maybe dying in space. They were losing oxygen. They end up breaking the door down or Drax breaks the door down. Back on the ship, they're now trying to save Rocket because they have the information they need to turn off the kill switch. And it's not working at first. And this is where we get our hallucination with, and we've seen this in, you know, all the films when people are, when someone's got to ascend to heaven or go off to the afterlife or whatever you believe in. He has a moment, he sees his old friends and he's like, can I come, you know, cause we, we were in the sky and we're having fun. And you know, Rocket, oh, so heartbreaking. Can I come with you all? Of course. You know, he's walking to his friends, but then Isla stops and says, no, not quite yet. This has been your story the whole time. You know, you still have more to do. And he's like, oh, what do I do? I got you guys killed. It was my fault. He's like, there's the hands that created us so the hands that do wrong but then there's the people that guide to the hands which was a pretty cool line uh very powerful just the themes of this film perfections embracing your imperfections embracing your flaws supporting one another not playing one another loving all creatures on earth being human and, and supporting humanity and things of that nature it was just very strong in this film so they do that and this is where rocket you know wakes up i was so happy because i was missing him the whole film as i mentioned earlier he wakes up and I i'm not gonna lie got emotional man because this is a character we never see get emotional and i'm talking about nebula when they're on the you know rockets like where's nebula he's like oh. and they think that they died on the ship but clearly we know they didn't so rock is like oh she's on the intercom and this is where peter is like oh you guys are okay where are you at like we're on the ship we were trying to save you and the whole joke you know i can get out of i can break out of a plan but then nebula hears rocket in the background it's like yeah we got rocket back and she gets emotional and starts like crying man i'm like this is getting me emotional because we never see her get to those moments. So I, I really enjoyed that moment, uh, knowing that they saved their friend's life. So now the plan is <laughs> we got to save them on this ship that's just sitting into that space. We have the moment where they are in this area of the ship where these all these kids has been tested on and, and it's the the origins of the new you know civilization that the high evolutionary wants to create and they just say i can't remember what nip nip nub nub i can't remember what the three words they were saying that pissed off gamora and no one knew what they were saying a good moment and as i mentioned in my non-spoiler review and i mentioned earlier in this video that i love that drax the destroyer was a you know something that they brought back to the character but then they also bring in the other side of the character which is he is a careful like he's stupid dumb but he has a heart he does love his family when, when you're under his wing he takes care of you so we have this conversation between mantis and drax and nebula about him being stupid and mantis sticks up for him right and this again this film to me really made me appreciate these characters i'm referring to mantis and drax who i think are just completely useless in two and in the holiday special but it really hit home for me in this film of their brother and sister dynamic 
that's like Drax is like her big brother. She's a little sister, but she's more, you know, kind of emotionally more evolved and emotionally more mature. She's emotionally more mature than Drax. So I love that she defended him in that moment. And she kind of comes at Nebula like, you just, you find the flaws and weakness and incompetence. And I just, I just really appreciate that scene because it really kind of put in perspective that brother and sister dynamic from Mantis and Drax. So High Evolutionary finds them. He threatens to kill them and they have to meet him at his, you know, his ship which we get them set up now that it's now it's time to save them, which brings us into the ending of the Guardians of the Galaxy. So at this point, I appreciate you guys clicking on this video. We have already broken down the most of the film, and now we're kind of getting into the ending of this film, how it all wrapped up, who lived, who died, and we'll transition into the post credit scene. So now we're at the end of the film, make their way to the ship. We have, you know, Rock has now been revived, and I'm so happy he was back with the crew because I was missing him throughout the film. We have Rocket, Peter, Gamora, Groot are now going to save Nebula and Drax and Mantis. So they're on the ship. End up the High Evolutionary sends them in this pit, which we get the return of those creatures. Abelisk, if I'm not mistaken, was the name of the creatures. They are in the pit with them. And then this is where Mantis, she really stepped up in this movie for me. This is where she touches them and that they only eat batteries. They don't eat humans. They're probably scared of them more than they're scared of, of, the, of the creatures. So they're able to control them and ride them uh, to where the rest of the Guardians are. And now they're like, okay, we about to leave. But this is where the Guardians, and I believe it was the Beast boys that play at this point we get another homo shot of all of them together again one of the things that i wish was more prominent in this film was the guardians together right because it took us almost two hours to get them finally together but they're finally together and they're now ready to go to war so drax opens up the door we see all the high evolutionaries guards coming in this scene here there's obviously so many moments in the MCU of group shots, right? You can think of the first Avengers with our Avengers teaming up and fighting in New York. You can look at the Avengers 2 with them fighting and fighting against Ultron. And there's so many other, and the Guardians has their own, you know, the first Guardians they're fighting. Always these moments of the groups coming together. <sighs> Man, this might be one of my favorites, y'all. When we see them in the hallway, all of them using their powers, their skill sets. You know, obviously, Peter has his guns. He sets off the, the bombs, electrocutes people. Gamora is slicing and dicing through people. Talked about it in my full breakdown. Nebula and that T-1000 arm is just ripping through people and doing her thing. She gets her head, like, knocked off, and she's still shooting people. Rocket, my man, with his guns flying through comic books, frame frame. This ah, so many perfect shots. Groot rips through someone. You know, we see so many different variations of Groot in this film with Kaiju Groot, and we'll talk about Alpha Groot a little bit later. But he's doing his thing. Drax doing his thing. Mance is doing her thing. Ah, I love that hallway scene. It is just so perfect. Let me know what you all thought about that in the comments. But the Guardians are now saving these kids. And actually, prior to them saving the kids, there's a really good scene here of not just Drax the Destroyer, who I was so glad that we got the, re the return of the Beast Mode Drax, but we see Drax the Dad. The kids that have been captured and been experimented on by the High Evolutionary are scared and nervous. You know, they see Nebula and she's yelling at them. They're they getting nervous and scared, but Drax calms them down and does this little boop, 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 <laughs> his robot monkey dance, which I, I'm not going to lie. It was kind of goofy the first time I saw it, but I really, I really appreciate seeing it on a second time because it shows you the, the layers of Drax. He is a destroyer. He is goofy. He could be stupid, but he's also a carer and a protector. So I really enjoyed that scene there. So the kids, you know, they back off from the wall they blow out the door meanwhile at this point craglin's been kind of craglin and and cosmo and space star were kind of like i don't want to say forgotten about but they weren't as important to the movie until now peter calls them we need your help craglin he gets nowhere gets the head and you know brings the ship to them so they can bring all the the children and, and obviously the rest of the guardians and what we'll talk about here a noah's ark moment with all the animals coming up to the ship we see that this is how they get involved. And meanwhile, the high revolutionary is on his high horse. He's like, get Rocket 891, you know, 89, 139, 219. Get him by any means possible. Send out all of our fire, like Thanos in Endgame. Send all of our troops to take them out and get this done. Meanwhile, his like second in command science is like, dude, you have lost your marbles. You are wrecking everything that we have built over these years. She takes over, but you know, she doesn't because the high evolutionary just kills them and wipes them all out, sends everyone to the corridors. And that's where we get, you know, I mentioned that fight sequence. So meanwhile, again, at this point, the Guardians have taken out everyone. They got the kids. This is where we get another emotional moment. 
oh, really emotional moment where Rocket goes into Hatch 89, or at least where he was, where he was kept, sees these adorable, adorable baby raccoons, which was once himself. And we actually get the origins of where Rocket comes from. He's North America, and he finally, everyone's calling him a trash panda, a raccoon, a squirrel. But he finally finds out that he is an actual raccoon. He takes all the rac baby raccoons and puts it on himself. Dude, my heart. Ah, I love that moment. Unfortunately, Mr. High Evolutionary comes, uses his power, throws Rocket up against the wall, talking his stuff. You are an abomination. This, this, that, and the third. I just want your brain and all this stuff. I'm going to kill all your friends. And Rocket, which was a callback earlier in the film. You guys remember at the beginning of the movie when Rocket was climbing on the ceiling when he was talking to Nebula about Peter and talking to Peter and getting him out of his feelings. She's like, why are you climbing on the ceiling? Oh, I'm just testing out these new shoes to you know defy gravity or whatever. That's how he was able to get himself in the wall because that was one of those genius experiments to, you know, interfere with gravity. He gets off the wall, shoots the high evolutionary. I was so prepared for this moment because I wanted him to get his ass beat the whole damn film with all the stuff he did to those animals, to Rocket's friends, to just experimentations that he's been doing and killing off all these, spe these species and races. I was happy for this moment. Rocket shoots him, Brute knocking him in, Nebula knocking him in, Peter shooting him, Mantis, everyone's getting their licks, man. <laughs> My man got stomped down, but then he gets the killer blow by Gamora. So he's now on the ground, his face comes off, and this is, we see the result of what Rocket did when he scratched off his face. And Rocket has a chance to kill him then and there. He doesn't do it because he's a guardian of the freaking galaxy. Question is, we don't, hey, I come from that old school. If I don't see a body, they're still alive. We don't see him die. So question I have for you guys in the comments. Is the high evolutionary still alive? Did he manage to get like on this spare ship and, and go off into space and regroup and maybe come back in the future? We know. I don't think he's dead. If you don't see a body, he's not dead. Okay. So let me know if you guys think he died on that ship. But as this happened, meanwhile, again, the uses of Adam Warlock, he's kind of in and out of the film, very much just a setup for the future of the character. But he's now on the ship, comes back all angry at Groot, and he falls out because he's been through the ringer at this point in the film. But Groot end up helping him. And he wakes up and says, why did you do this? I've been trying to kill you the whole movie. And I am Groot. And it translates to Drax says, everyone deserves a second chance, which I don't think was an accidental line. I think that has to do with James Gunn being fired, being brought back and hired to do and finish his trilogy. I don't know. I might be stretching there, but everyone deserves a second chance, which is, I believe in that mantra as well. Second chance was given to Adam Warlock. Remember that because Adam Warlock helps them out a little bit later. They're getting everyone off the ship and Rocket tells them we need to bring everyone with us, not just the children, but everyone, all the animals has been experimenting on. So we see all the animals coming onto the ship and going to nowhere. This is where... Everyone jumps off. Peter, I'm like, Peter, come on, man. He drops his Zoom player. Obviously, we know the significance of it because uh, it's from his mom. He drops it. He goes back. And as I talked about in the breakdown, there was the fake out Drax death. There was the fake out Drax Nebula uh, Mantis death. Obviously, there's the fake out death with Rocket. We get another fake out death. <laughs> we have Peter. He's left behind. He doesn't make the jump. He thinks really quickly on his feet. He grabs like one of the wires and holds it down so he can use the pressure to blow himself back into the ship. But unfortunately, with the gravity in the space, he gets caught. We see him in space. No oxygen. I don't know where his mask was, by the way. Like where was Peter's mask that he's worn throughout the, the entirety of his MCU? I guess he didn't bring it this time around. He has, he doesn't have his mask, and we see, I'm thinking to myself, I'm getting emotional because Mantis, Peter, and we see Groot start to cry like, Peter, and he rips his hands out there. He's going back to everyone deserves a second chance. This is where Adam Warlock proves that he is kind of a changed person. He saves Peter. I love that shot, too. It was very visually stunning when they, he saved him and going through space. Listen, when he gets to making his Superman movie, the flight sequences will be on point. Trust me. We see him talking about James Gunn. He uh, So he saves Peter, running jokes throughout the film. Does that look cool? Did that look cool? Did that look cool? Peter says that I look cool as he's coming back. And, and that's it in the film. They they defeat the High Evolutionary. They save all the people on his ship and the experiments. They save all the animals. Rocket gets him, gets his revenge of a sense. He doesn't kill the person that created him. Instead, he gave him a chance to... to to, I think, live uh, or to be a better person. But we'll see what happens with the High Evolutionary moving forward. But now this is where the waterworks came down for me. So now the Guardians are finally back together. Gamora's going back with the Ravengers, and he has this moment with Gamora. Like, she asks him when she goes back, and she says, I bet we were fun. He says, you would never believe how you know how good they were together. But she goes with the Ravengers, and I assume, based on Zoe Zaldana's recent comments, that this, you know, pay people enough money to come back. But 
I mean, she doesn't need the money. She's been in some of the biggest films of all time, not only with the Guardians, but the Avengers movies. And of course, she has Avatar 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So she doesn't need the money. But if she has the urge to come back, who knows? But recent comments now, she says she, this is the last time she's going to play the character. She would want someone else to take on the role. We'll see. But we're assuming that she's off doing her thing with the Ravengers from now until whenever we see her again. And if they recast it, we'll see. So she's with them. They're back on nowhere. And this is where Peter goes back to the callback to earlier with Mantis and the, the metaphor joke that she told Drax to say to him, uh, you know, a lily pad and learning how to swim. Well, he's going to learn how to swim because he wants to go back to Earth to re be reunited with his grandfather, where Peter's going to go off to we'll talk about the post-credit scene. Speaking of Mantis, she wants to kind of do her own thing. She's been just from Ego and, you know, helping the Guardians. She now wants to be her own person, her and her three little pets. They're doing their thing. Drax wants to help her, which oh, we'll talk about Drax. That got me so sad when he's waiting and crying at her that was so sad he is like oh i'll go with you to protect you he's like i don't need your protection he's like, no no not in that way i just you know i want to be there for you like your big brother he's like no drax i got it meanwhile Neb was like no drax i'm gonna need you here because we got these kids and we got this new you know nowhere to take care of and he's gonna be so they're gonna be the protectors of nowheres nebula and drax are gonna protect nowhere meanwhile we need a new captain ladies and gentlemen and that is the one and only rocket the raccoon baby we all know he was really the captain the whole time. Peter, you know, you know what I'm saying? But no, he's the new captain of the new Guardian. So before we get to the ending or the post credit scenes, the film wraps up with the, you know, everyone saying their goodbyes. And when Drax is waving at Mantis and getting emotional, we've never seen him cry. I don't think ever in the, in, in the entire MCU, he's crying because he's saying goodbye to his little sister. They say their goodbyes. Meanwhile, the new captain. Rocket Raccoon plays uh, Florence and the Machine, Dog Days are Over. Perfect song to end out this chapter, to end out these characters going their ways and saying goodbye to the Guardians. They're dancing and Jax, ah, that was that was a perfect ending, man. Like, that was a very satisfying conclusion for these characters that I've loved since 2014. I wasn't, I didn't know much about the Guardians prior to that film, but to me, they are the perfect quintessential Marvel family to me they're the mcu first family if i'm being honest with you they are the best family unit to me in the entire mcu yes i love the avengers and they you know they were a fine family unit but we didn't really spend that much time with the set of the avengers different variations of the, of the group uh obviously we got the ant-man family but you know we got the black panther family which i love but there's really not much of a family left with that or lost all his family so they to me are the most consistent family of the mcu and i, and I love them man and i thought it was just a perfect ending to wrap up this great trilogy it's not my favorite trilogy I'm going to probably make a separate video of ranking it, but it is up there, but it's not my favorite. Uh, but it's, it's a great way to conclude these great stories. I thought James Gunn wrapped up this story perfectly. As I mentioned, it has its bumps and some things I maybe would have changed, like having Rocket more involved in the main narrative. But now, so that's the end of the film. Perfect way to wrap up the movie. But then this leads us to our not one, but two post credit scenes. So mid credit scene number one is the introduction of our new guardians of the galaxy let's go over that line up so our mid credit scene is set up where we see our new guardians on this planet protecting people against these like hyena type creatures we have our guardians led by rocket raccoon of course we have craglin we have cosmo the space dog we have uh adam warlock and we get the introduction to alpha groot which was so cool to see but then there's a new character that we're going to talk about here and that character goes by the name of phyla who when i saw it the first time i couldn't make out with it with filler phyla but it's phyla and phyla actually is this galaxy in the comics i believe she is part of the 2008 run and there's a couple other runs that so she's in there also goes by the name of quasar and is known to be the dog Daughter of Marvel, who is a Cree. So I don't know if they're going to tie into all that stuff there with her being the daughter of Marvel, who we met in Captain Marvel. You know, she a Cree. Are they going to take creative liberties and kind of do their own thing with this character, Filer, uh, who goes by in the comics and name um, Quasar, who Quasar is a name that many different characters within the Marvel Cinematic or the comic books have had. I believe Ova had that name at one point and a couple other characters, but essentially. You get you get Dawn the name Quiler because you have the uh, the powers and you have these quantum bands I believe is what I looked up earlier that gives you that name which goes back to that scene you'll notice as the new Guardians are going to take on these creatures she's like kind of floating in the air and cosmic things going on her wrist which explains going back to her that that you know the name that she goes by in the comics and those quantum bands so. I'm very intrigued to see what they do with Filer moving forward and if we're going to see her being aged up because that brings me to this point here. 
when will we see these guardians? You know, when's the next time? James Gunn is, is doing his own thing now with the DC being co-CEO with Peter Safter. And it's been six years since the last Guardians. Can we anticipate another six years before we see this version of the Guardians again? Will they pop in? I would imagine, you know, Kane Dynasty, Secret Wars is probably like a no-brainer. But think that we'll see a Guardians 4 prior to that film or after those films. Who would be the director of a Guardians of the Galaxy 4? Because I would have never picked out a name and a hat of James Gunn directing his great trilogy. So, you know, there was a point in time when he was fired and he wasn't going to direct three, uh, this new Guardians film. So I'm very curious on who that list of directors that they were. I think at one point Taika's name was brought up, which I'm so glad that that didn't. I'm glad that James Gunn was brought back in general, but I definitely didn't want Taika around. I'm curious to know that, that short list of directors that was going to place James Gunn back when he was fired. So... I, I can't even think of someone that I would imagine. Um, Joseph Kaczynski, the director of, I don't know, Top Gun Top Maverick. Uh, Lyman, who's done some stuff with sci-fi. So let me know in the comments, guys. Who would you like to see direct the Guardians of the Galaxy 4? If you would want to see a Guardians of the Galaxy 4, just them being used every now and then for like big event films like the Avengers. So, man, I'm very curious on when we're going to see this group again. Uh, or if we're going to, because imagine, I mean, Adam Warlock's such a big character. I would imagine... Even if we don't get them as a group, we'll see one or two of the, you know, Guardians give me more Rocket. Since you guys did the genius, which was brilliant, you didn't kill Rocket, bring him back in some way, somehow, because we know that he was an Avenger at one point during Endgame. So I'm very curious to see what we will get with this new Guardians of the Galaxy. Let me know what you all think about that new group. But that brings us to our official post credit scene, which, as I had mentioned, this, the movie ends with Peter going back to visit his grandfather, which he ends up, you know, reuniting with him. And that was a very emotional scene with his grandfather crying and being happy to see Peter again because Peter didn't think, number one, he didn't think he was alive. And number two, he didn't, last time he saw his grandfather, he was, you know, a little mean to him in his perspective. But again, Mantis put it in perspective. He just lost his daughter. He just lost his grandson. So it's probably a lot he was going through. At his grandfather's house, they're having cereal and he's talking about, you know, maw, mowing the lawn of his neighbor and, and the neighbor's oldest son watching an older man cut his grass. He's just like, that's weird. What, why would he just do that? But meanwhile, as you probably noticed, the paper, the newspaper that the grandfather was reading, it had the headline on there that ties into the holiday special. It said that Kevin Bacon talks about the time he was kidnapped by aliens, which if you've seen the holiday special, he was kidnapped by Mantis and Drax. So that is the end of the post credit scene, him just eating cereal and back to mow the grass. But then we get the title card comes up and says, we will get the return of the legendary Star-Lord. So that puts in another big question. When will we see Earthbound Peter Quill on Earth? When will we see him again? I mean, again, the no-brainer, Secret Wars, Kane Dynasty. But then the, the possibilities are endless as far as Earthbound heroes ground level heroes man i'm just thinking off top peter interacting there's so many characters i would love to see him interact with but one that comes to mind we know peter is a great thief and we know another a, a great thief in the mcu and that's scott lang uh even though i wasn't the biggest fan of quantum Manium, i would really be down for a just from an actor perspective i'm a big fan of chris pratt i think he has great comedic time and especially just being a fan of him from parks and rec and then obviously matching that with scott lang's ruds comedy i would really think they would be a good match you know banter and, and having some good back and forth you know he already met peter parker uh obviously this is a good this is the question out there when dr strange dispel does it affect people that's not on earth because obviously he he doesn't know peter he knows of spider-man but he had his mask off when they were on you know titan so can will peter quill know peter parker uh that would be pretty interesting and it's just i mean the list goes on and on and on about who he can interact with and maybe come across nick fury and and, and you know he's been in space so he has the knowledge of being in space and, and different coordinates so let me know in the comments, guys. There's just so many different duos that I would love to see Peter Quill, now who's Earthbound, uh, to interact with. But let me know what you all thought about the mid credit scene, the post credit scene, the end of the movie, and just the movie in general. That's going to wrap up this video. I'm going to probably cut this up into the ending and the post credit scenes. But just for everyone that watched this entire thing, I appreciate you all. This is a fun film. Again, I initially gave it a 3.8 out of 5, but after seeing it a second time, man, it really hit. The emotional beats hit the second time. It gave me more context with things I might have missed the first time. So I'm going from a 3.8. I would, I would bump it up to a a four to four and a half. A four to four and a half. I'm feeling more confident on the 
the four because there are just still some things the Adam Warlock of it all and the uses of the character, some of the comedic beasts in land to me. I wish Rocket was just more involved in the main journey of the Guardians and again just remixing, rearranging the the motive of why he would have helped the Guardians to find Lila and stuff of that nature to find out that she's still alive. So I do wish that Rocket was more involved in the narrative. But overall, man, the emotional resonant really sticks with me the writing was just so well done the themes of again embracing your imperfections and your flaws and sticking up for others and helping those that need your help and just the the the, the fundamental of the guardians is being protectors so i just thought it really stuck the landing and just really a great trilogy man so i'm at a four out of five for right now but hey again this is the end of the video put your score in the comments your favorite moments least favorite moments what worked what didn't work what Easter eggs and all the different stuff that you guys find out. Cameos we did. I forgot to mention Howard the Duck was in the film, as well as we got the Yandu making his return. So let me know your thoughts in the comments below. You all are awesome. Before you all leave this epic video, in the meantime, like, share, comment, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. You all are awesome, as you can see on the screen now. Come and join the community. Check out my original review of this film. Check out my all my MCU content, and we'll catch you all on the next breakdown.